Prologue Greetings from Canada and South Africa, Humo Army. I would like to begin this episode by thanking all of those who have taken the time and the few coins you have to support Miss Demeanor, also known by now to many of you as Penny Morris. Over the last couple of years, our friendship has grown, and as her friend, I believe she deserves a better living condition and life than she is currently existing in. After all, she lives in South Africa. Remember that each dollar helps, and as soon as we have her back on her feet and in a safe place, her Patreon will be discontinued. For those who feel like they just want to make just a one-time donation, hit me up and I will give you her details. I'll put her Patreon link in the show description. It's autumn now in South Africa, and general elections are a month away, so the main aim is to get her and her disabled son into a place where they don't have to jump at every sound outside the window every half hour, and to give them the opportunity to start over. We all deserve a second chance, and to raise our children in a safe and happy environment. And with that, let's get on with the show. For those of you who are hardcore true crime fans and who still debate the nature versus nurture issue, please excuse me as I slowly fall into a 40 winks catnap. I have heard the debate so many times that I just can't get excited about it anymore. Of course, the way a child is raised will eventually affect the outcome of his or her future, but as humans... We possess that wonderful gift called free will. Not everyone raised by addicted and neglectful parents and who is surrounded by abject poverty and the constant enticement of crime becomes a gangster, a criminal, a killer, a rapist, or a repeat offender. There are far too many true crime stories in which a person decides that they will rise above their circumstances and become someone more than a repeat offender. Still, it's undeniable that how, where, and by whom you are raised does have a major impact on the path you choose to follow. It takes courage, hard work, and determination to rise above your station in life, but it can be done. Unfortunately, it happens far too often that if you were born from neglect, violence, addiction, and wondering where your next meal comes from, that the path you will choose is less traveled. You might not be able to choose your family, but you can choose your friends and the way your family influences your future. So decide wisely. In the cases we explore today, the families, or rather their deviant behavior, won most of the time, which is an outright pity. I guess the lesson to learn today is that if you use your free will wisely, regardless of your childhood and circumstances, life can offer opportunities that will improve, uplift, and enrich your destiny, which leads us to... The Bogle Clan. The story of the Bogle Clan is so bananas that if I did not have factual references, I would have thought it was nothing more than the script of an outrageous movie. But the truth is, really sometimes stranger than fiction. This family spawned four generations of criminals from Origami Top, Texas, with a mixed bag of charges ranging from fraud to murder. Instead of blood, a deviant strain of poisonous blood ran through each and every one of the members of this bunch of misfits. Instead of a well-functional family, this brood was fused together by an immoral and poisonous mix that ran through their veins. The usual strong bonds were replaced by unhealthy boundaries 
and the normal terms of loyalty were completely blurred. According to an article in the New York Post, when Bobby Bogle was four years old in 1969, he woke up on Christmas morning with a single gift from his dad. To most of us, we would envision a set of miniature hot rod cars or a football. They're wrapped in simple brown paper, was a heavy metal wrench. Bobby might still be considered a toddler, but he had been in the family long enough to know that this just meant one thing. Later that day, he and his brother would break into the local convenience store with the wrench and steal bottles of soda. When his father, who went by the name Rooster, learned of the theft, all he said was, Yes, that's my boy. To Rooster, his children, first crime successfully committed was almost comparable to a report card with straight A's. This was the beginning of the fourth generation of Bogles who would commit crimes on a regular basis since 1920. The Klan had its origins in Texas in 1921 when Elby and Louis Bogle, no relation, fell in love. The couple were dead broke but decided to run away to the carnival. Louis did odd jobs while Elby was the breadwinner riding a motorcycle up and down curved walls for $5 a week, and all the tips she could muster. At night, the couple slept in railway cars and drank away whatever they made. Elby would go on to have five boys, who all would follow a criminal career path. During the winter months, they went back to Texas and slept wherever they could find an empty hallway or abandoned home. Their own family had shunned them by now. Lewis ran distilleries, but when caught, would only get a suspended sentence since the prisons were already full. The clan lived like proud outlaws, and it's rumored that the gangster Pretty Boy Floyd used their shack as a hideout. When he left, he gave LB money to buy shoes for her boys. During the 1930s, carnival work dried up and the clan had to invent new ways to get money. From the moment they could see over a steering wheel, they would hijack trucks and once even stole a safe. The boys were not the brightest sparks and used a blowtorch to open the safe, leaving drops of melted and molten specks of metal on the bills. The moment the boys began to spend the money, they were arrested. Rooster would spend time on probation for the theft and for shoplifting. He was the youngest of the brood and fell in love with Kathy Curtis. As soon as he was released from the penitentiary, at the age of 19, the two would get married. Rooster gained no favors from his parole officers by refusing to get a job, so the matriarch of the clan decided that the entire family would move to Oregon, where their second son, Charlie, had become a metal worker. Thirteen days into his job on a mushroom farm, Rooster staged his own slip and fall and claimed $980 from an insurance company. Later that year, in 1962, while on a family drive, Elby told Rooster to sideswipe a passing truck. The family blamed the trucker, claiming he injured the heavily pregnant Kathy. This scam paid the family out a cool $10,000. Rooster continued to do everything except a hard day's work. He had more kids with Kathy and went permanently on welfare. At one point, he was arrested for the delinquency of a minor, but once again he just received probation. This warning did not stop him, and he seduced another 16-year-old girl 
who was a migrant worker by the name of Linda White. He promised her marriage, but instead just moved her into his and Kathy's home. Kathy claimed that she did not mind because this way she would see more of Rooster, since he would not be out at night chasing after Linda. The Bogle clan stole everything from chickens to cows, from lumber to steel, and once even broke into a government-run fish hatchery just to gorge on salmon. Rooster kept on having sex with both women, often at the same time, and when he was drunk, he would beat them. Linda would have two children with him and Kathy a total of four. All in all, he would have nine children with different women, and all of them would end up with a criminal record. As soon as the boys were six or seven years old, Rooster would get them drunk, and by the time they were 11 or 12 years old, he would take them along to pick up women, even offering them sloppy seconds. When Kathy's son Bobby turned 16 years old, she took him to a strip club and burst out laughing when he realized the star of the show was his own sister, Melody. Rooster taught his boys the one thing he was good at, and that was stealing, and soon they surpassed his craft. Tony, the oldest, loved to torture dogs and cats by setting them on fire, and once did it so many times, he caused a forest fire. His first arrest was at the age of 12, and would end 10 years later with a murder trial. Tony claimed that he had only choked his victim after he had tried to rape his wife, and she had bashed in his skull. His sentence was 26 years to life, and to this day it seems he is still behind bars. The violence in the family was such a daily part of life that when Bobby and his baby brother, Tracy, believed that they were cheated in a deal, they went to the man's house and bound both the man and his girlfriend to chairs. The two men proceeded to beat both while they were tied up. Tracy tried to force the woman to give him oral sex, but he had a limp dick from drinking too much earlier. They eventually fled with the woman's purse, jewelry, and her car, but they were arrested the following day. Bobby was sentenced to 30 years behind bars because he had already eight different felony convictions against him. Tracy, however, had no adult convictions and was sentenced to 16 years in prison with a lifelong label of sex offender. This meant that even after he was married following his release, he was banned from being near his own baby. Since his first release, he had been back twice to prison for a variety of offenses. When asked after, Tracy said, We did it all as a family. We broke into houses while Mom drove the getaway car. We pride in our family. So it was fun. We were a crime family. The crimes of the Bogle clan might only be tales of hereditary anecdotes, but another field of thought, which I agree with, is that mental illness definitely ran within the Bogle family. There also seems to be a genetic marker as to how they handled stress. A landmark study in the 90s by the think tank the Heritage Foundation was named the real root causes of violent crime. It concluded that the main causes were parental love deprivation and broken families. Poverty also has a major role to play, but a secure bond with one's parents can make all the difference. During a study with the Bogle family, who had all served time in one institution or another, this happens to not be the case. The strong bond they had is what made them such unrepentant criminals. When the study was done about the Bogle clan, it was originally thought that there were six members of the family in prison. After the study was concluded, 
the number was actually found to be 60. Poverty, abuse, and alcoholism were also factors. One of the homes the family lived in was constructed with battery crates, which still had acid leaking from them. The family used to joke that the chemical smell at least kept the cockroaches away. They were never concerned about the toxic nature of the crates. They would murder people and then call members of their family from their victims' homes. None of them had a high IQ, and underage sex and marriage was as normal as a sunny day in Florida. It was as if their crimes became part of their mythology and something to be aspired to. But not all families with a lineage of crime have the same pride in their misdeeds. The Bogle clan might have been the kind of family that stayed together because they slayed together, but in Ohio, a drama is still unfolding as one family was decimated for what would ultimately be a motive that made no sense and that would eventually scar a community forever. Part 2. Family feuds, both fictional and factual, have been one of the most prevalent plots gracing our history and literature as a human race. From Romeo and Juliet to the Hatfields and McCoys, we seem to be intrigued by the drama and complicated ties that bind two families and the unfortunate results that happen when the fight gets out of hand. The recipe of taking two families adding a bit of conflict, letting it simmer in a family dynamic that is passive-aggressive at best and violently explosive at worst, has made many a network producer and director a millionaire. And although many of us snub the hundreds of soap operas currently available to watch, I personally know a couple of hardcore people who have admitted it's their guilty pleasure. Perhaps it's the fact that, unlike friends and acquaintances, we can't choose our family, and somehow, as we try to navigate the complex and often dysfunctional pathways of our own relationships, it's a relief to know other families are far worse off than our own. Granted, these days we are less seduced by the portrait displayed on our screens of what a normal family is considered to be. We realized it's the vast minority that can be as perfect as the Partridge family or the Brady Bunch. Even the finely crafted sitcom The Cosby Show ended up being tainted by the allegations, litigations, and inevitable incarceration of the man so many would try to emulate as being the perfect father for years. The characters in the story I am sharing with you today would have made perfect actors in a melodrama. And if it wasn't for the fact that this story is a true crime horror story based on facts, it would read like a novel and feel far too fantastical to be true. I had so many mixed emotions while writing about this case, and in the end, only one question turned over and over in my mind. If no one won in the end, what was the point? As you will see, everyone lost in the end. To set the scene of this twisted, tangled, and tragic tale of two families, I would like to tell those of you who live outside the USA about the geographical and general vibe of the area where this story takes place. Ohio is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful states in the country, with brutal winters and endless summers, home of the lovely and talented Michelle Gower, but also to the Sexton family. Until a couple of decades ago, the two main industries that strengthened the state's economy were farming and factories that produced cars and parts. Slowly but surely, over the last 30 to 40 years, these manufacturing plants had been closing down, retrenching, and firing folks 
whose entire future plan depended on having a job that would provide for a comfortable retirement. As the poverty numbers grew, the spirits and household incomes declined, and more and more abandoned homes, vacated as a result of foreclosure, became drug dens and temporary shelters for the homeless. The rate of poverty has climbed consistently, and the debate around whether it was the drugs, the crime, or the gangs that came first is as pointless as asking whether the chicken or the egg came first. The beauty of the majestic Appalachian Mountain Range that frames the countryside with gorgeous canyons and wildlife that is breathtakingly stunning is suddenly marred by the fact that each and every city or small town now has an area that is deemed dangerous, and unless rock bottom left you nowhere else to go, you should avoid at all costs. With the rise in unemployment came the growing number of homeless people, and what better way to forget your sorrows and the life you had before it all went to shit than to do drugs. And of drug dealers, there is no shortage. It appears that heroin, methamphetamine, and oxycodone were the most popular drugs. And it's not even shocking to see a news headline shouting that another pill mill or meth lab had been shut down in a rural countryside or a little town time almost had forgotten. Nestled not far from Columbus and 80 miles from Cincinnati lies the tiny town of Piketon in Pike County. The total amount of residents is estimated at about 2,200 on a good day, and despite the lack of a movie theater or any other form of entertainment, the place encapsulates good, wholesome country living at its best. Everyone knows everyone, and I am sure the gossip mill gets a good turn every now and again, but there is something that speaks to the sense of community when people gather at gas stations for a friendly chat or in the familiar faces you attend the Sunday morning church service. That was until something went terribly wrong between two families that would not only include as many as four generations of family members, but leave distrust, disgust, and division in a town so small that, had it not been for this tragedy, we might never have even heard of it. But enough about the place. Let's meet the players on one of the saddest cases I have ever covered. Despite their unfortunate surname, the Rodent family were just your average small-town, close-knit family. Dana and Chris Sr. Rodent were born and raised just like their parents and grandparents, in Pike County. The two were high school sweethearts and decided to tie the knot in 1994, shortly after leaving school. Soon after the couple started their new life together, they welcomed their firstborn son, Frankie, followed by Hannah Mae, and finally, young Christopher Jr. would join the family. 16-year-old Chris Jr. was described as a bit of a bad boy. In the spring of 2016, he had just passed his driver's license test and offered to take anyone anywhere they wanted to go. The boys also loved hunting and fishing and all the activities the outdoors could offer. He and brother Frankie were also huge fans of demolition derbies and would tinker for hours on cars they wanted to modify or build up for the events. The only way I can describe a demolition derby to anyone who doesn't know what it is is to describe it as a kind of a competition during which uh, built up and modified four-wheel contraptions crash into each other in a haze of dust, fire, noise, and cheering until there is only one man standing. Most of the audience are men, incidentally. 
At the time of the inevitable crime I am about to tell you, 21-year-old Frankie had set up house with his girlfriend, Hannah Gilly. They lived in a trailer a stone throw away from Chris and Gary, with Brantley, who was three years old from a previous relationship, and six-months-old Ruger, who the couple had become parents to. Frankie, like his father, did work in construction, and Hannah Gilly had plans to further her studies in business administration and open a daycare. The couple wanted to get married and have a big family, which Dana encouraged. To her, there was no greater joy than spoiling and loving her grandchildren, and with the family living in such close proximity, support and a helping hand would also be readily available. Chris is described as a friendly and hard-working family man who had a real talent for carpentry. He worked in construction and loved building up cars, a passion he clearly transferred to his sons. Dana was a nursing assistant at an elderly care facility, and friends and family would describe her as bubbly, caring, and full of life. After a couple of years, Dana and Chris decided to divorce, but the separation was very amicable, and all the family members would remain on the land Chris had inherited, mostly on Union Hill Road, to keep the family close and help each other with the rearing of the kids. A couple of miles outside Piketon, the Wagner family lived on a sprawling farm with a colonial-looking main house straight from a Norman Rockwell painting. Like the rodent family, their roots run deep in the community, and the Flying W was one of the most successful horse farms in the state of Ohio, with their net worth estimated at about $4 million. The family were well known in the area. Angela and her husband Billy, who stood at a sturdy six foot seven, had two sons, George and Jake. Both boys were attached to their mother's apron strings, and Angela took it upon herself to homeschool her children. The dynamic was, however, a bit strange in the sense that Angela seemed to be the one that swung the scepter. Despite his massive stature and sullen and brutish nature, it was, in fact, Angela who made all the important decisions. George is described as good-natured with a wicked sense of humor, and Jake was known for his giving nature. Despite a few rumors about business dealings that have gone sideways, the family seemed like any country folk you will find in any old country song. Billy seemed like a difficult character to get along with. He was cold and rough around the edges. It seemed that neither Jake nor George ever left the home they were raised in. Stranger still are the rumors that Angela had different sides to her. Some would recount times when she would provide food and clothing to people in need in an almost selfless manner, while others described her as cunning and shrewd. She apparently had the passwords to all their social media accounts, including dating apps. She later claimed that Billy was the controlling one and that she often feared for her life. But to those who knew her, it never appeared to be the case. She definitely wore the pants. When eldest son George married his wife, Tabby, the couple moved in with Angela and Billy. The marriage, which produced one son, was, however, short-lived. Tabby would describe the relationship as incredibly abusive and controlling. Over a period of a year and a half, she was forced to relinquish any forms of communication she had with her own family. She would, one evening, arrive at her mother's doorstep with her son, and despite many attempts to get custody, she could hardly establish supervised visits. The Wagners kept her son as far from her as possible. 
In my humble view, the relationship between Hannah May and Jake began as a crime. When the 13-year-old Hannah May and the 17-year-old Jake started seriously dating, everyone called it young love. But to me, it's statutory rape. Regardless of my opinion, Hannah May fell pregnant at 16, and both families jumped in to help the young couple navigate parenthood. They seemed very much in love and even had wedding rings tattooed on their ring fingers. Even though she was a teenage mom, Hannah May was described by all as an attentive and happy mom. She even went back to school to show off little Sophia, born in 2015, to the teachers and classmates. It seemed ideal, with Angela even claiming that Hannah May was like a daughter to her. Jake had taken up a job as a truck driver to provide for his young family, The cracks had begun to show. As the couple tried to cope with the daunting task of being parents to little Sophia, cracks started to show in their relationship. Jake became controlling and abusive. Chris Jr. would tell a friend that Jake treated his sister like shit. He had become overprotective and there were rumors of abuse. In April 2015, the couple finally split. Jake would later claim that Hannah May was unhappy because of the long hours he worked, but it's more probable that she had enough of his cohesive control. Jake was devastated and would openly burst into tears at the mention of Hannah May's name. He tried his best to rekindle the relationship, but Hannah May made up her mind and had soon after the breakup started dating other young men. The fact that she continued to sleep with Jake did not help Jake's emotional state with regards to his breakup. He had clearly lost control of the situation and now resorted to hacking into Hannah Mae's social media accounts and installing cameras and other surveillance equipment around the rodent family's property. His obsession with Sophia and having full custody seemed to have become an obsession with Hannah Mae. What further upset Jake was a month after she officially ended the relationship, Hannah Mae would start to date Charlie Gilly, Hannah Gilly's brother and Frankie's best friend. The relationship was, however, short-lived. She then started to date a man by the name of Corey Holden, and when she realized in April 2015 that she was pregnant, The very real possibility that any one of the three men in her life could be the father came to light. Jake was convinced it was his, and even went as far as to purchase baby clothes and necessities for the unborn child. He even offered to take custody of the baby, regardless of who the father was. By this time, the custody arrangement and co-parenting arrangement had completely broken down, to a point that Hannah blatantly refused that Jake could see Sophia. In a power move that blows my mind, the Wagner family drew up a document which gives Jake full custody of Sophia and her unborn sibling and tried to force Hannah to sign the document. To give the document validity, grandmother Aretha Newcomb stamped and signed it which is an action that will come to bite her and the power she had as a notary in the back. Hannah May, who by now was wise to the various ways the family manipulates, said no. Knowing that Tabby, George's ex-wife, had experienced the same forms of abuse and control in the Wagner household as she did, she reached out to her for advice. The family told her to not, under any circumstances, sign any documents given to her by the Wagner family. In July 2015, Hannah May would write the lyrics to a song about abuse, and she ended the post with these words, End domestic violence. Live a happy life. Jake did not hold back his anger at Hannah May 
and in front of witnesses told her, I will fucking kill you. Only a couple days before she would find out how vengeful Jake and his family could be, Hannah Mae wrote in a DM to a confidant, I won't sign papers. I won't ever. They will have to kill me first. While all the drama was unfolding, Hannah Mae had her baby shower early in April of 2016, and she gave birth to a healthy baby girl she named Kylie. Paternity tests would later reveal that Kylie was indeed Corey's child, but not before a spree killing the likes of which the people of Pike County never would have been able to envision in their worst nightmares. The morning of the 22nd of April 2016 seemed like any other at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains, Spring had already begun to sprinkle with sparkling dewdrops when Bobby Joe Manley, Dana's sister, approached the trailer of her brother-in-law, Chris. His cousin Gary from Kentucky had been visiting, and for reasons unknown, Chris had asked Bobby Joe to feed his dogs. She found the door locked when she arrived at the mobile home at 7.45 a.m., but because of the arrangement, she had a key to the front door. As she swung open the door of the trailer, she was met with what can only be described as a blood bath. The room that greeted her was streaked and splattered, crimson, and the bodies of Chris Sr. and Gary lay in full red display. The scene was so bloody that on her desperate call to the 911 operator, she would say that she believes the two men had the hell beaten out of them. Chris had been shot a total of nine times, and the medical examiner would note extensive bruising on his body and clear drag marks, showing he had been dragged across the floor. Gary had been shot twice in the head. As the operator told her that help is on its way, and that she should stay outside the house, Bobby Joe went to the home of Frankie and Hannah Gilly, more than likely for support. Three-year-old Brantley opened the door, covered from head to toe in the red liquid that covered the crime scene from which she had just escaped. Opened the door, she asked her nephew, in a shaky voice, where his parents were, to which he eerily replied, Daddy's playing zombie, referring to the show The Walking Dead, of which the family were fans. Entering the home, Bobby Joe would find both Frankie and Hannah Gilly shot to death in their beds. Frankie had been shot three times in the head, and Hannah Gilly a total of five times. Six-month-old Ruger was found unharmed with his parents. Bobby Joe immediately called her brother James and told him in hysterics about her discovery. He made his way to his sister Dana's home and found both Hannah Mae and her mother dead in their beds from gunshot wounds. Hannah Mae had been shot four times in the head and once in the eye. Five-day-old Kylie, who was cradled in her dead mother's arms, was left unharmed. The body of 16-year-old Chris Jr. would be found later in a separate part of the trailer home. It appeared that he had tried to hide away from the killers, but was trapped and killed, with four gunshot wounds to the head, just like the rest of the family. Dana had been shot three times in the head and once under the chin. Little Sophia had been picked up by her father the previous day and was not there at the time of the murders. Later that afternoon, as loved ones and community members tried to come to grips with the tragedy, Donald Stone, cousin of Kenneth Rodent, who happened to be Chris Sr.'s brother, decided to check up on his relative who lived close by in a camper. 
Kenneth was found dead in his camper, with a gunshot through his eye and dollar bills strewn all across his limp corpse. The relevance of the dollar bills is still unclear. With eight people dead and four crime scenes to process, the Pike County Sheriff's Department soon realized they were not equipped to handle what would turn into the most extensive crime investigation the state of Ohio had ever seen. With 200 investigators full-time collecting evidence and following up leads, it appeared that movement in the case had been slow. Sheriff Charles Reeder, who appears to be the lead investigator as well as a press spokesperson, tried to reassure the community, but the little town was divided and a former unknown fear had crept into their previously simple daily rural existence. Sheriff Reeder would later be heavily criticized for his handling of the case, including that the fact that all four trailers were lifted from their current location and placed into a property on which stood what would be referred to as an evidence warehouse. By moving the homes, it is believed that evidence was disturbed and journalists would find the gate to what was supposed to be a secure location unlocked. But the sheriff would later have much bigger fish to fry. In June of 2019, he would be charged with tampering of evidence and the stealing of government funds to feed a pesky little gambling addiction he would claim to have contracted as a result of the pressure this case caused him. He would also publicly and emotionally plead for the people of the county's forgiveness. But I think the penalties for people who steal from taxpayers' money should have twice the punishment, especially because of their position of power and trust. The disgraced sheriff was fired, but all this happened in 2019. At the time of the tragedy, he was still sheriff, and he knew he had a massive crime scene to process. He was later, however, aware that more boots on the ground were needed, and thus the Ohio Center of Criminal Investigation Bureau was asked to assist in the investigation. As the community and remaining members of the family tried to come to terms with the devastation the mass murder had caused, Attorney General Mike Duane immediately took lead of the investigation and started releasing press releases. Due to the fact that Bobby Joe and James were the two people who found the victims, they were immediately interviewed and Bobby Joe would be asked to take three separate lie detector tests, which she all passed. Her brother James, on the other hand, failed the lie detector test, which he was reluctant to take to start with, and his resistance in cooperation did nothing except put a bullseye on his back. We now know that a lie detector test is not admissible in court and currently viewed as junk science. Cops tried to track his movements by installing a tracking device on his truck, but he discovered it and removed it. He would be charged with the vandalizing and tampering of state property, but the charges would be dismissed. Both would, however, later be cleared of any suspicions. As the investigation proceeded, it was discovered that the family was also involved in cockfighting. Weed plantations in three of the crime scenes all large enough to indicate that the purpose of the crops were distribution instead of personal use. The crop would have yielded the equivalent of $400,000 worth of marijuana, and Ohio at the time was about to pass a bill that would legalize the selling and distribution for medical use. In total, there were 200 plants located at the properties, and each estimated at about $400,000 in street value. The possibility of a syndicate being involved was briefly but seriously considered, but it seemed unlikely since cartels would have murdered the children too. Once Mike Duane broke this news to the community, all efforts to raise funds to help the family to bury their loved ones 
was stopped, and those who had pledged money quickly retracted their offers. Frankie and Chris Jr. had also recently gotten into a heated argument with another family, which resulted in a wild fist fight, which only ended after the grandfather of their opponents pulled a shotgun and fired it into the air. But the family with which the rodent family and the disagreement were quickly eliminated as suspects. It baffled the investigators that the three children, as well as the dogs, who never seemed to have alerted their owners of an intruder, were left alive. There appeared to be more than one shooter, and the murder plan had taken careful and sophisticated planning over a period of time. All the victims except Chris seemed to have been killed in their sleep. Chris, however, had been shot far more times than any of the other victims, and had defensive wounds on his arms, including a shattered bone from a gunshot wound. The families of the victims were not the only ones to reach out and ask for help. On Angela's urging, and even though her family seemed financially very secure, urged Jake to start a GoFundMe with a personal goal of $20,000. The post that accompanied the request, which apparently was made on behalf of Sophia, read as follows. These were expenses I was not supposed to have. I was supposed to spend time with her and give her a happy childhood. Sophia and I are asking for just enough to settle the fees acquired as a result of the horrible tragedy that happened to her mommy. I hate seeing my daughter cry. We just want our lives back. The request backfired because, frankly, people felt offended by the request for money from one of the wealthier families in the county and made by one of the main suspects in the crime. Shortly after the crime took place, and while investigators were still piecing this puzzling crime together, the Wagner family decided to sell everything and move to Alaska. The move struck everyone as odd, but they would claim the plan had been in the making for some time. Not too much is known about their brief time in Alaska. The family lived in a double trailer and were in the process of purchasing a house within a couple of months. It seems to me that the men took up work in construction again, but the rumors inevitably followed. The members of the Wagner family would just tell people they are innocent and the only reason they were so far from Ohio is to give Sophia a better life. They were regular members of their local parish and it would be through the young pastor there that Jake would meet his wife. Elizabeth, or Beth Armour, is another victim in this awful tragedy. The young Sunday school teacher and aspiring artist had her reservations when Jake started courting her, but she would claim Sophia stole her heart and her pastor vouched for the family, claiming that all the rumors doing the rounds were untrue. The couple were married in May of 2018, and it did not take long for Jake to start his shit again. She was forced to hand over all forms of identification as well as passwords to all her accounts. The isolation and verbal abuse soon followed, and it wasn't long before Beth knew she had made a terrible mistake. It was only once she was in Ohio with the Klan, and they accused her of betraying the family, that Beth realized nothing about the family was as it seemed. She was apparently kicked out and tried hard to get a divorce from Jake, but because she was for intents and purposes, homeless and had to couch surf. She had not been able to stay in one county long enough to execute the divorce. She made a Facebook post, which has since been removed, to defend herself and explained she knew about the case, which turned out to be not much. Her whereabouts have since been unknown, and with the reputation of the Wagner family the way it's been, Hiding away is perhaps not a bad idea. Another suspicious action on their behalf is the fact that Jake produced documents to file for full custody of Sophia 
six days after the murders. Anyone who has ever had to navigate the legal system will know it's a time-consuming maze with an incredible amount of paperwork. Yet Jake had everything ready to go six days after Sophia lost her mother. The court did give him custody, and off the Wagner family went to Alaska. He would claim that he wanted to get Sophia away from the terrible incident which undoubtedly had changed her life. The Wagner family were already looking like likely suspects, but investigators needed more evidence. They soon found it in a box marked Important Stuff. It was also well known that Billy and Chris Sr. had a falling out in April 2016 with regards to a business venture that did not work out. Homemade silencers were also found in one of the wells on the property the Wagner family once owned. A receipt for the purchase of the same type of shoes the killers wore on the day of the murder were also discovered. Angela was positively identified on surveillance cameras at the Walmart where she purchased those exact shoes. It would later come to light that they wanted to frame James Manley for the crime. But at the time, Angela told investigators she bought them for her boys, and since they didn't like them, she threw them away. George and Jake were also seen on cameras at a Walmart buying magazine clips, ammunition, brass catchers to catch suspended bullets, bug detectors, and equipment to make a homemade sound surprise. Despite their careful planning of the crime, the shooters had made the mistake of leaving behind three shell casings with DNA on them. In May of 2017, the Wagner family returned to Piketon. It's believed that one of their relatives was gravely ill and needed assistance with settling affairs. Sympathies for the family had waned, and even distant relatives were complaining about harassment. Rubbish was dumped on their properties, vehicles were vandalized, and Angela even had someone in a shop throw a bottle at her back. Angela continued to proclaim the family's innocence and would frequently defend herself and her family online and beg people to leave them alone. The numbers involved in this investigation were staggering. Over 1,100 tips were received and over 500 people were interviewed. Over 200 investigators were involved and over 200 warrants and subpoenas were served. Over 200 pieces of evidence has already been tested and the case accumulated over 350,000 case and legal files. As if this twisted tale could not hold more surprises, one of the folks in the inner circle of the Wagner family contacted investigators with information about an assassination attempt the family had planned. The three targets of their wrath were Attorney General Mike Duane, Sheriff Reeder, and another one of the top officials in the investigation. We still don't know who this informer was, but considering how close the family is, this turn of events is surprising, and people have rumored that it is Jake's wife. The prosecutor felt by now he had enough evidence and the wheels of justice started turning for the victims of the second largest mass murder, only exceeded by the Pulse Massacre in the state of Ohio to date. On the return of the Wagner family and the pending threat to officials, six members were immediately arrested. 76-year-old Frederica Wagner Mother of Billy was arrested, as well as Aretha Newcomb, mother of Angela. Both were charged with tampering with evidence and hampering the investigation. But Aretha, for her part in forging the papers Hannah May was supposed to sign, was charged with forgery. Angela, Billy, Jake, and George were all charged with the eight murders of the Rodent and Gilly families. Billy was arrested in a horse trailer on his way to Kentucky, and George and Jake were intercepted at an intersection. Angela, who was perceived to be the mastermind 
Aretha and Frederica were arrested at her home. The charges of obstruction of justice against Frederica and the additional charge of forgery were, however, later dropped. With the death penalty on the table, it was inevitable that the Wagner family would turn on each other. It was, however, a huge surprise when 26-year-old Jake turned out to be the first one to flip, settling for eight life sentences in return for delivering evidence against the rest of the family. As he pled guilty to the murders, which were read one by one, it was hard not to notice a slight hesitation when Hannah May's name was read, which was followed by what can only be described as a smirk before he pled guilty. He would eventually admit to being the murderer of five of the rodent family members. When Jake turned on his clan, 48-year-old matriarch Mama Angela quickly did the same and pled guilty to all the charges against her. In her statement, Angela admitted that she was involved in the planning of the murders and that she was actually minding the children while the crimes were taking place. During her court appearance, she appeared almost smug. She received a 30-year sentence for her part, but even behind bars, she still tried to control the narrative by constantly contacting witnesses and trying to influence their testimony. Authorities got fed up with her meddling, and she was warned, and all her phone, letter writing, and visitor privileges were suspended indefinitely. Part of her plea deal included that, just like Jake, she would testify against her husband and her son. On the 3rd of May, 2023, George Wagner went on trial, and his defense would argue that the only reason he was involved was to ensure that his father does not kill his brother. This would be a very revealing time as well, because the hard and ugly facts would only be revealed during his trial. The family was described as almost cult-like. On the surface, they seemed to be a perfect little family. But it was clear Angela ran the show. As the boys grew older, she gained more control, even convincing Jake to resign from a job she thought was not good enough for him. The unusual dynamic would be the foundation of the prosecution's case. Everything was done together, from finances to homeschooling. Every decision was made as a family decision. One of the FBI's agents would testify that Tabitha was systematically isolated and distanced from the family until one night when she had a fight with George and his mother and Angela told her she was going to kill her. Tabitha ran away, hid in the pouring rain until the sun rose, and then fled to a gas station where she made her first contact in many years to her family. Her family picked her up and she never went back, but this was a wake-up call for Hannah. At the hearing, no bones were made about the fact that Hannah eventually followed Tabitha's lead and left because of mainly domestic violence. Her pregnancy with Charlie Gilly's child was told to Jake and his mother by her. During the trial, the FBI agent testified that shortly before the homicide, Hannah made it clear to Jake that they would never get back together again. During this time, Jake wanted custody of his daughter, and Tabitha, after fighting for custody of her son, would only be given visitation rights, but these visits would often be infrequent, and when she tried to make arrangements, the negotiations would be peppered with insults. As the forensic evidence with regards to the ballistics tied all the murders to the Wagners, Tabitha finally got full custody of her son. Agent Schneider testified about wiretaps, which implicated him in the murders. Angela's orchestration was highlighted with regards to the footwear evidence, and the agent revealed that over 8,000 hours of evidence with regards to interviews and wiretaps were presented. At any time, 
Everyone was holding their breath for George to bend the knee and take a plea, but all he wanted was to be put in isolation. As the trial continued, George was looking worse and worse. The state believed that his entire purpose was to be looked over, but his lack of direct involvement convinced me that they would not easily sentence him to death. The state highlighted the fact that Hannah was shot in the face, disfiguring her. The defense complained that Elizabeth Wagner's location was not known and therefore she could be interviewed. She was, however, in hiding and being protected by the state because, as a crucial state witness, both felt her life was in danger. The prosecution told a story that was by now too familiar of a young woman who was controlled. On the night of their wedding, Jake insisted on all her passwords. She was accused by Angela of poisoning their food, and Jake and his mom confronted her with accusations of abuse. Jake told her if it was true, he would beat her with a bat. Elizabeth knew she was being gaslighted, but like any other woman in this situation, leaving would take time. The brother of George opted not to have his testimony recorded, and his testimony was shocking. He told the court that he had rearranged Hannah's body so that her baby would suckle on her dying or dead mother. Jake told the prosecution that after they had left the first crime scene, his father ran out of Chris's trailer shouting, I've just shot and killed my best friend. He said that he killed Dana first because he was worried she would get up when the baby started crying. Jake said it was difficult for him to testify against his family and that he wanted nothing more than for all of them to go home. He mouthed without sound to the Roden family, I'm sorry. He admitted that they were a crime family with activities ranging from arson to stealing high-priced items. They would steal everything from fuel to livestock to cars and that he learned to pick a lock at a very young age. Jake had been recycled into a life of crime. He admitted that his relationship with Hannah was violent, but he refused to admit that he had choked her. After the breakup, Jake said that he and his mother were concerned about the safety of his daughter when Hannah started dating Corey, whom they suspected of being a drug dealer. He was concerned that his daughter was going to be molested and that the murder plot took flame when they became aware of the DM when Hannah said that his family would have to kill her before she would give up custody. The original idea was to frame Corey, and that the first plan was to make it look like a murder-suicide. Jake told the court that the murderers got home after 4 a.m. and immediately burned their clothes. He sawed the guns in half and tried to melt them with a blowtorch, but eventually gave up and just removed the serial numbers. He and George then buried the parts under a beam in the barn. He said he felt guilty from the beginning and that he did not speak or make eye contact with anyone in the house. When Angela took the stand, she made no effort to disguise her love for her family. As a deathly quiet court paid attention to her testimony, she refused to look at George. She never looked at George. She opted out of having her testimony recorded on video. She admitted her part in the crimes without hesitation. She was questioned about the way she raised her children, and she affirmed the crimes Jake laid out to the court that the family committed. Not much new was learned, but one thing that stood out was when she was asked about the arson. She said, Yes, but who gives a damn? As expected, George claimed he had nothing to do with the actual murders. His defense team, who were all ready to admit his involvement, went back into his childhood and tried to paint a compassionate picture, but the jury saw through it. 
he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole a month after the trial began. We thought about waiting for Billy Wagner's trial to begin in the beginning of 2025, but what is really left to be said? The only question will be whether he, when and not if, is found guilty, be sentenced to death or get life without parole. The death penalty has become a bargaining chip, but I doubt Billy is the kind who will bend the knee, but facing your own mortality can make a person think twice about your steadfast beliefs. Once his verdict is in, we will definitely follow up, but frankly, the last person to be executed by lethal injection in Ohio was in 2018, and more and more states are not following through with the sentence. If you want more info on the death penalty, I highly recommend you listen to our episode on the death penalty and its history, which we published last year. What infuriates me the most is the arrogance and impunity with which the Wagner family committed this diabolical crime. Not for one moment did any of these narcissists think of the impact their crimes and the possibility of being caught would have on their children. As soon as the arrests were made, Sophia, the nucleus at the center of this disaster, was whisked away and placed into protective custody. Kylie was placed with Corey's family, since he was the biological father, and Brantley and Ruger were placed with relatives. It's unclear where George's young son currently is, but the children whose whereabouts are known seem to be doing well. All in all, five very young children's realities were forever altered the day of the massacre. I doubt the babies will remember any of the crimes they lived through, but I have to wonder how much Brantley remembered and whether the prosecution will call him to the stand as a witness now that he is a little older. Regardless, at the end of the day, it is the children involved that have to pay the price of a family's pitifulness. And even though justice is in the process of being served, five little lives had the course of their lives changed forever. This episode was written by Miss Demeanor, a.k.a. Penny Morris. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.